In 1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. Welcome to Space Vidcast 335 for Friday, October 29th, 2010. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is a beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Terry and Higginbotham. Not always, actually. You weren't, you weren't here last week, and I was terrible, terrible by did, myself. Did you still introduce me? Uh, you know, I. Did you just have the empty chair, and I as with me as always is. Oh no! Oh! Oh! You know, we've got some really great stuff coming up for you on tonight's show. We've got. Uh, Pat Duggins, who is the author of Trail Blazing Mars, NASA's Next Giant Leap. He'll be on in the back half of the show, talking about where we're going from here uh, with uh, NASA. And additionally, last week I brought up the 10K in 10 Days promotion, which was we wanted to raise $10,000 in 10 days to buy a new broadcasting setup for SDS-133. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty lofty goal, right? I mean, we're a great tight-knit community, but... Uh, and I love how you didn't discuss it with me before you said it on air. Not at all. Came home and said, hey, guess what I did? And I said, <laughs> I, what did you do exactly? And uh, if you've been following the website, I put a graphic up, and there was a red bar, and it would grow green as we got more and more mm -hmm. uh, funds available. And if you look, uh, we've actually got a fully green bar that actually goes off the top of the graphic. We've actually been able to raise more than the... Yeah, uh, that wasn't a coding issue. No, no, not at all. <laughs> That's and what it's supposed to look like. That is due in no small part to the new Space Vidcast founders that have signed up. So yes. thank you to all of the founders. And in order to become a founder, you had to spend at least $1,000 in the donation That's to huge. become a founder. We had several people become founders. Mm -hmm. So thank you to all the founders. We had several people sign up at $100, uh, quite a few at 20 and 10 Every one of those donations helped out. Huge. But the big one that helped us the most is we have a new sponsor. Ooh, that's a newbie mistake. <laughs> we have a new sponsor for Space Vidcast, specifically for our HD coverage, because they single-handedly help make that work, make this work. And it's Perforce.com, Perforce software. It's version control software. And the reason this actually makes a lot of sense is we have got a ton of geeks that watch this show. I am one, you are one, CAF is one, absolutely. And a lot of us are software geeks and a lot of us code and develop and maybe we're stuck with source safe, maybe we're yeah. stuck with some version control that doesn't really work the way we want it to. We have to change our workflow to make the software work inside of its version control system. <laughs> well, Perforce, they're the guys who make software that works mm. the way you want it to work, that works in your workflow. And you can get a free trial by going to their website, perforce.com, and you can actually get grab a two-seat license of the entry-level system and, and give it a shot. Try it out, right? I mean, you don't just have to necessarily take our word for it. Right there, it's HD free. streaming. spot. And these guys are awesome. They're bringing you they're the ones who are bringing you STS-133 in high definition. They're the ones who have made this possible. They sponsored the entire purchase of the new 12-core Mac Pro, which has been ordered and will be here tomorrow with a brand new giant GPU. It's going to be epic. And so we're going to bring them up. Uh, uh, we bring them up in the shows because they mm -hmm. more than deserve it. Bring yes. them up during STS-133, and I did want to personally thank them quite a bit yes. for making this happen. So perforce.com. Speaking of STS-133, this is what you can expect.
will both be, as well as the Space Big Cast crew, Tim Bailey and uh, Jason Ryan will be at Kennedy Space Center bringing you live high definition coverage of STS-133. As far as we know, we are the only place on the planet that streams high definition uh, shuttle launches and the best part about this is because we're moving in this new system it won't just be high definition for a little bit during the launch time it will be high definition from that moment forward and I don't just, oh, just mean crazy. that moment until landing I mean we will be permanently streaming NASA TV HD in multi-bit rate HD which means that if you've got a mobile device you'll be able to watch it on your mobile device if you've got a Roku and you want to watch it in high def you can watch it on your Roku on high def iPad, computer, whatever. If you can't take HD, we've got it. It'll automatically size it down to a standard def version for you automatically. It's going <laughs> to be awesome. We're excited to watch the last flight of Space Shuttle Discovery with you. And as another extra added surprise, now no guarantee here, but we're going to attempt to use a new system that will allow us to bring you, the community, in via video and audio uh, into the conversation. So as we've got uh, we'll say we're interviewing a PAO, we can actually bring you in and you can ask your own questions of the people down at the Kennedy Space Center because we want to get you guys involved. This isn't our show, this is a community show with everyone. So not only is it going to be high def, but we're also going to have total community participation. Oh, it's going to be so messy. Event. It's going to be the last <laughs> messy, not awesome, but m you chose the word messy. It's going to be awesome and it's <laughs> going to be so messy. Oh yeah, lots of new stuff that we're trying to do in absolutely no All time. All at once. That's this Monday, for those of you not paying attention, November 1st, 2010 is Monday. All right, so that's STS-133, final shite, sh final flight. <laughs> ever of Space Shuttle Discovery. Very good. Let's hope there I don't do that in Florida. Uh, speaking of live streaming, at ESA actually, the European Space Agency, yes. they have got a live stream coming up tomorrow morning. If you're watching this on demand, maybe not tomorrow. Uh, and that's going to yeah. be, uh, they've actually got a, uh, they've had a two-day mission and planning operations group talking about potential asteroid impacts and, and potential threats to Earth from space. Mm -hmm. And the results of this are going to be streamed live tomorrow, or at least uh, Friday morning, right. at 11 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. For those of you in the U.S., that's 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 4 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So it's a little bit early for those of the, us in the U.S., but you can figure out your time zone offset from 11 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. The uh, really... Just watch it live. Uh, we'll, the ESA will have it on their website, ESA.int, I-N-T, and we're going to try to restream it on our website here at Space Vidcast at spacevidcast.com slash live. And it's just one of those one of those reasons that humans should be in space, right? Just, we got to get off the Earth. we yep. get, we got to protect, there's no cradle lasts forever. we got to get out there and do this thing. Speaking of other really cool live streams, JPL, hit it. <laughs> so, uh, JPL, oh, oh, look, they're actually doing something. Is that live right now? It's live right now? That's very cool. Oh, unless you're watching this on demand. Then, well, that, then that was live while we were recording. Right, right, right. It's live to me. <laughs> um, JPL has set up uh, what they're calling a quote-unquote curiosity cam. So they're building the latest Mars rover named obviously Curiosity. And if you're curious about Curiosity, now you've got a camera. Uh, but you can watch the technicians uh, working on Curiosity. It's very cool. And it's not uh, very close to the camera, and these guys are very far away. Actually, it's a very, very large rover. It's about the size of a car or so, they've said, which the other rovers haven't been nearly as big. So I think some people were a little confused by that. Uh, but they do normally work from about 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time, Monday through Friday. So we just happen to... We just have, happen to get them. Oh, please. They're JPL. They work 24 hours a day. <laughs> so. They like to wear the bunny suit. We, we all know it. They like to be like, I'm wearing a bunny suit. I'm doing cool things. Speaking of Mars, are, would you have anything else? Or can I no, I mean, that's pretty much it. Eddie, you can, like you can hit the, yeah, you can hit their Ustream, uh, Ustream.tv slash NASA JPL. Uh, and if they're not doing anything at that particular time, they do have some sort of highlight videos at the bottom of the page. And uh, as Pete has mentioned in the chat room, and I was going to do this after the show, we'll be adding that live video into our Roku channel. Yeah. So if you don't already have it, if you get a Roku box, which are the most awesome little boxes ever. I know that Google ha TV has their and own thing. they're thing, really little. But they're tiny. You plug in. I like it ba way more than the Apple TV. Google TV yet to be seen, but definitely Roku. Love our Roku box. Yeah. Uh, we've got our own channel. Uh, 
It's free. Grab that. We've got Space Vidcast Live in high definition, and then you can also get the ISS feed, yep. which is on and off, and then you can we'll add in the JPL feed as well. So right there, you can boom, 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 get your space fix, uh, which is really cool stuff. And speaking of Mars, as I segue twice, now our guest tonight is Pat Duggins, who is the news director at Alabama Public Radio, author of The Final Countdown, NASA, and the End of the Space Shuttle Program, and of course the author of, bam, right here, Trail Blazing Mars. I did that in pre-show too. I couldn't quite yeah, get you it. Yeah, you did. Trail Blazing Mars, NASA's Next Giant Leap. Pat, welcome to Space Vidcast. And audio this time. Hang on one second, Pat. Is audio Hmm, we can't hear you, Pat. Awesome. Again, we'll just guess at what he's saying. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, sorry, good night. Really? <laughs> this is where we're going to take the awkward moment. Yes. In one of these. Hmm. That's hysterical. And his audio is up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> brought it down, brought it back up. Watermelon, passion fruit, passion fruit, watermelon, watermelon, passion fruit. <laughs> This is why we're internet. There you television. go, exactly. Buy the book! Here, I'll hold up your mine too. There. <laughs> Alright, Pat, so watch, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do one of these. And then we're gonna do one of these. Now we're ringing. So everyone can see it ringing. Alright, let's see. And see if we're back, gang. Hi. Oh, Yay! Yay! Yeah. Yo. We, victory is ours. There we go. Well, now, as, as Tom Hanks said in Apollo 13, we've had our glitch for the mission, so here, we're, here, we're, here we are. <laughs> See, now what I have to do is decide if I actually want to edit that part out or if I just leave it in there for the realism no, of the show. No, it's... Oh, the, the blackmail thing with me holding up the book. That's great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Pat, welcome to Space Vidcast, um, and thank you for already having the mission glitch. Uh, that's, that's good to... Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about Mars for a moment, but uh, let's go back to the beginning because we've looked at Mars for a really long time, a really, really long time. There's been this mystique around Mars when there was confusion over uh, canals versus channels. Uh, I mean, s start at the beginning for us. Well, I mean, you know, Mars has held a, fa held a fascination for people all the way back to the books of like, you know, H.G. Wells and Edgar Rice Burroughs. And, and, and you're right. I mean, you know, when, when NASA was getting ready to launch the very first unmanned probe to go to Mars, Mariner 4, back in 1964, they were dealing with members of the mainstream press that were expecting Martians. I mean, they were raised on War of the Worlds and John Carter and the adventures on Barsoom. And there were people writing articles expecting at the very least plant life on Mars. And some people were expecting Martians to be just, you know, waving to Mariner 4 as as it sped by. So it, it was kind of like the science fiction meets science fact when they found out that Mars was, was pretty much dead, kind of like the moon. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the real exploration started up with uh, the rest of the, the Mariner probes and then on to Viking and then who knows, maybe someday human beings. And we haven't, we, we've been to Mars, but we haven't had total success at Mars, right? I mean, right. We, we've had, we've sent probes that have just slammed into the surface. Mars is hard, right? Mars is not oh, as easy to. Without a doubt, yeah. For a long time, the, the, the working theory is that like maybe one out of every three missions to Mars actually succeeded. In fact, the very first Russian mission, uh, which was a Zon-2, uh, was basically referred to, it disappeared. And what happened was the people at JPL were making jokes about a great galactic ghoul coming on and gobbling up the Russian spacecraft. But even NASA's had a hard time with it. I mean, uh, the, the Mars Observer basically disappeared. Some people think that it uh, developed a leak in one of the fuel tanks and that put it into a spin that it couldn't get out of. And then, oh, the problems they had with the, the Mars Polar Lander and the Mars Climate Orbiter. We can, we can go into that. That was an embarrassing moment for NASA. But you're right. I mean, Mars is really difficult. And if we send human beings there, it's going to take a whole new type of NASA, a whole new type of right stuff and a whole new mindset on the part of the American people before we actually try to send human beings there. Actually, let's, let's talk about the failures for a moment. Let's talk about some of the things that happened on Mars. We had the uh, English metric conversion problems. Um, we, we've had, uh, go into it. I mean, tell us what, what has happened on Mars. I don't think everyone realizes how well, hard this is and all the problems that have occurred. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, are, are the English metric that goes back to the Mars Climate Orbiter, and it was one of two vehicles that was sent during the, uh, the smaller, cheaper, faster gig that NASA was into in the, the late 90s. 
And as you mentioned, one group of ground controllers were using English units, and the other ground controllers were using metric units. And unfortunately, uh, they, they think the craft basically burned up in the atmosphere because it came in at the wrong trajectory. NASA thought, well, that could never possibly happen again until they tried to land the Mars Polar Lander, which it was coming in. It had just gone through the atmosphere, and its legs were about to pop open. Uh, and when it did, unfortunately, there was some kind of a... Of a, of a a mistaken signal inside the software and it thought oh i'm on the surface of mars so it just shut its engines off about 100 feet off the ground and then you had a whole bunch of pieces down all over the surface of mars so again nasa looked doubly silly and it wasn't until the uh, the, the landing of the mars phoenix which was leftover parts from the follow-up lander that uh, nasa was able to kind of like you know put that behind them and move on and that was a big deal. I remember we covered that live. That was one of our largest events. It was, it was deemed, huge. I think it was the seven minutes of terror uh, based yep. on the radio delay between, we didn't know, right? I mean, it, it, it did EDL and we had no idea, uh, entry, descent, landing, for those who don't know. Um, we, we had no idea if it actually w was successful for seven whole minutes. Oh, that goes back to, to, to the Viking landers. I mean, I, I, I spoke to Gus Gustafaro, who was the uh, one of the head managers on the Viking project back in the 70s, and even for them, it was the seven minutes of terror before they landed. But even though Mars Phoenix, which landed at the North Pole and did a whole bunch of experiments, was a big success for NASA, it may indirectly lead to an, a big embarrassment for NASA because it discovered that there may be organic materials in the soil of Mars. And if that's true, then it's possible NASA found evidence of life on Mars back in 1976 with Viking and ignored the findings. And I remember seeing those. And Viking was a way more, in today's dollars, way more expensive mission. I think you've said in your book it was like worth uh, somewhere around three and a half billion dollars. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. It was one of the very earliest of the, of the Rolls-Royce missions, so to speak. And when I, I interviewed the, uh, the scientists who were responsible for Mars Pathfinder, they occupied one floor of the multi-story building that was built specifically for Viking. Uh, one of the one of the managers quipped, you know, a billion dollars is an awful nice thing to have. You know, they didn't have it for those later missions. But back during Viking, they really broke the bank on it. Now, Trebles asks a good question in the chat room, which is, why are there so few Mars missions? There should be more Mars missions. So why is it? Why, why do we concentrate our efforts on where we're concentrating our efforts now? Namely, uh, human flights to the International Space Station. Certainly, we're looking at the moon again. But why not more Mars? Well, a multi, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a number of different reasons for that. As far as putting human beings up into space, and I go into this in my first book, Final Countdown, is that the Clinton administration came to the realization that Congress is a people business, and a congressman would rather have his picture taken next to an astronaut who triumphantly returned from space than to stand next to a probe that's going to go off and study Uranus. So it, it, that's, that's where the people fit in. Now, as far as doing more missions to Mars, NASA claims that what they're doing is kind of a, an incremental sort of a thing where they go and they study the geography of Mars, the geology of it. They're trying to figure out can they get water and they can break that down into either hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. Can you possibly grow plants on Mars? There was one scientist connected to Mars Phoenix that speculated that the chemical makeup of the Mars soil, you could grow asparagus or green beans or all sort of things, sort of the, you know, the EIEIO bit on Mars. So you have to answer all of those questions basically before you can send human beings there. Because as you know, the distance is so huge that you have to be confident in your technology. I mean, if you're if you're halfway to Mars and your spaceship breaks down, I mean, what do you think Houston's going to do? You know, we'll send the AAA to help you out there. Leave the leave, leave the hood up on your spaceship so they know that it's you. Those astronauts are doomed unless you can really count on the technology they take with them. So it's that incremental sort of the thing that NASA seems to be up to right now. But isn't that how human spaceflight with NASA works? I mean, you look at any mission that they do it it's they let's just say they're doing an EVA every single step they make is scripted and outlined like down every single thing every turn of a ra ratchet yeah. is is scripted and if something breaks down they develop scripts for how to fix it i remember the recent ammonia cooling problem on the right. ISS they develop testing i mean yes let me get that book hold on a second exactly so can, with the culture that we have today at NASA, that kind of do it on the ground and send it up to space, can we successfully get to Mars, put humans on Mars? I think what, the, what we started to do back during the, uh, the shuttle Mir missions was that uh, we tried to get away from necessarily choreographing every breath the astronauts take and instead just give them basic skills and say, okay, today, well, this is broken, go off and fix it. I mean, when you send people to Mars, I mean, they're going to have to recycle their equipment, recycle their water, recycle their food, 
They're going to have to fix their problems, solve their their uh, their social situations. Because remember, it's ten minutes for a radio signal to go from Earth to Mars, and then ten minutes for the response to go from Mars back to Earth. So if there's any kind of a crisis on the surface of Mars, it's probably going to be over before Houston even know anything happened. Mm. But isn't that the culture today? Will we have to change NASA's culture in order to put humans on Mars? Or is NASA not going to be the first organization to make it put humans on Mars because of that? Or is it irrelevant? Well, I think, well, I, I think that uh, I, I go into this in detail in the book as far as like, you know, how they're going to have to change what the right stuff is. Because right now, I mean, uh, for example, on the space station, they had a situation where they were installing the second toilet. And you had 13 astronauts on there. I mean, six with the shuttle, uh, six with the uh, the station crew, and an additional seven from the shuttle crew. So you have these overachieving, a OK, best of the best of the best, tang drinking bunch of people up there. And the commander during a press conference admitted his big concern was whether or not all of these people were going to be trying so hard to help, they were actually going to get in each other's way. So there are psychologists who say that if we send people to Mars, it might be a better idea not to hire Superman to do this, but maybe Clark Kent. Because you need somebody who can kind of roll with the punches and take the monotony of the flight, as opposed to one of these, you know, hyper-achieving people that are kind of used to success and used to, uh, you know, bending the situation their way in order to achieve success, and just get somebody who can kind of roll with the punches. So what do we need to do to get to Mars from where we're at today? Do we need to go to the moon first? Do we need to change the culture of NASA? Do we need to not do it with NASA? Do we need to do it maybe with private space? Do we need yeah. to do it in some other country? What, what steps do we need to take? to go from here to humans on Mars? Well, you raise a whole bunch of different questions. Let me take, let me take a stab at all of them. Number one, the, uh, the, Clinton, the, Clinton, the Obama administration has basically killed the idea of a return to the moon, which actually is pretty big news for uh, Alabama because NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, which is one of the, state, one of the, uh, the cities that Alabama Public Radio serves, uh, would have been in charge of the, uh, the development of the, uh, the equipment to go on back to the moon. So there were those who said, okay, if you go to the moon, you can test the technology that you're going to use to make sure that it works and then go on to Mars. Now, if that's gone, one thing that uh, the president's Augustine Commission, which he put together to kind of map out the possibilities for what NASA might do in the future, uh, said, all right, look, if you're not going to go to the moon, then you could possibly go and explore an asteroid. Now, you might think to yourself, why in the world would NASA want to go look at an asteroid? Well, number one, there is some interest in studying near-Earth objects or NEOs that could actually, you know, plunge into the atmosphere, uh, sort of like uh, the movie Armageddon that we have to send Bruce Willis to save us and everything. But also, if you, if, you, if you look at the way we might go to Mars, there are some people who say, launch from Earth, go directly to Mars, land on the surface and walk around and collect rocks, which is fine, except depending on the trajectory you take, it could be anywhere from three to six months. Now, as we found out on the space station, astronauts lose muscle mass, they lose bone density, and if you crash land on Mars by accident, it's possible the astronauts are going to be so weak they can't save themselves. So there's a school of thought out there that says, hey, instead of going to Mars directly, why not land on one of Mars' moons, either Phobos or Deimos, where there's less gravity to crash you, no atmosphere to burn you up, the astronauts get a chance to, you know, to, to regain their strength, catch their breath, and then from there, drop down on the surface of Mars and explore the planet that way. So if you do go in that direction, then possibly studying an asteroid first would be ideal, since Phobos and Deimos are glorified asteroids. You, know, you mentioned in your book um, Project Nerva, which was... Um nuclear rocket basically mm -hmm. uh, and the idea being a next generation propulsion to get us from here to Mars is something like that still possible or are we just so afraid of these next gen techs at this point or just uh, any potential or potential or <laughs> potential any, any potential disaster from that tech that uh, we would just never go down that road well, I think the potentiality is there, but uh, I think the point is, I think that most most of the people that I ever saw that were really, really worried about uh, a nuclear disaster involving a space vehicle were uh, unmanned uh, probes on a slingshot trajectory that would fly past the Earth a number of times before they would head out to either Jupiter or Saturn or whatever like that. Now, the uh, the notion of Project Nerva, which is the nuclear rocket you're talking about, number one points up, well, there's maybe the possibility of using nuclear power to go to Mars, but also it shows just how long NASA's been talking about putting human beings on the surface of Mars. You see, NASA, as you know, was created in October 1st, 1958. The very next day, they, entered, they, they hired a gentleman by the name of Harold Finger to head up Project Nerva, and I was able to interview Mr. Finger for the book. And as far as he was concerned, NASA was going to Mars. I mean, that was, that was his, his standing marching orders. And if that wasn't enough, 
Everybody knows the speech that President Kennedy gave at Rice University in 1962. You know, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, that sort of thing. Well, what they forget is that Kennedy took that exact same speech, delivered it to a joint session of Congress one year prior to Rice University. But when he gave a speech that time, that earlier version, he included wording about funding a nuclear-powered rocket to send astronauts beyond the moon and to the very ends of the solar system. So to the people walking around NASA at that time, whether it was Alan Shepard or Deke Slayton or Neil Armstrong, these guys thought they were going to Mars. In fact, the astronauts from Apollo that I interviewed for Trailblazing Mars say that they were expecting at least a manned flyby mission of Mars by 1979 and people actually walking on the surface of Mars by 1984. Now, I'll tell you, I'm 49 years old. That means that I, was, I graduated from college back in 1984. So the time that I and my contemporaries were listening to Men at Work and Culture Club, NASA's original plan was to have people walking around on the surface of Mars. And then what happened, right? Because that was the plan, and they, they actually had. They had the plan for Mars, shuttle, and station. So why was it Mars that got cut? Well, unfortunately, it was Apollo 11, because NASA uh, sold the American people, and Congress sold the American people, on, we're going to beat those darn Russians, and that's it. So when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, it was, okay, well, we've achieved our goal, and then psh, NASA's budget goes away. In fact, in a, in a case of what goes around comes around, there was a little-known scientist working at the Lewis Research Center in Ohio on nuclear propulsion to send people to Mars who saw the writing on the walls about NASA's budget back during Apollo 11, he then quit, went into the private sector, built missile systems until the mid-1990s when he came back as one of NASA's most controversial lead administrators. It was a fellow by the name of Dan Golden. And he gave up his, uh, his desire to go put people on the surface of Mars because of budget practicalities. And not too ironically, he was the one that came up with the smaller, cheaper, faster, budget-oriented philosophy at NASA that led to the, uh, the the crash of the Mars Polar Lander and the incineration of the Mars Climate Orbiter. So it's it's kind of one of those Elton John circle of life kind of things there involving the federal budget. So we've talked about our kind of the history of Mars, what, the fascination with Mars. Um, we've talked about us being able to get to Mars. Uh, the next step is um, when. Uh, you know, we're, we're in a transition time right now. We just talked about STS-133, the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, we've got 134, which will be the final flight of Space Shuttle Endeavor, and a possible, if it, not yet funded, but pretty base, just needs funding, STS-135, which will be the last, last flight, <laughs> as opposed to the first, last flight right. of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Then, Constellation is essentially canceled, so where do we go from here? Well, I'm kind of waiting to see if they come up with the money for that very last mission, because the reason it's so controversial is that, as you know, NASA's got enough spare parts for three shuttle missions, the two official missions they've got on the, the, the schedule for right now, and then that rescue shuttle, Atlantis, that's going to be standing by in case hap something happens to the other two shuttles. So if the first two missions go, and they decide to go with that last mission, it's kind of like, well, they're going to have to have a crew with a death wish or something, because if something happens like damage-wise to the rescue shuttle, NASA doesn't have the spare parts to send up a shuttle to rescue those people. Now, there's some who are saying, okay, well, fine, we can just put those guys on the International Space Station. But NASA always thinks like two and three missions ahead of time. So what happens if something happens to the space station? You've got like, what, ten people on board the outpost and enough uh, Russian lifeboat seats for six people. So what do you do? Play rock, paper, scissors to figure out who gets off and who has to stay on there? It's very controversial. And, and if they do send it up, that's going to be a heck of a story. But, uh, you know, one, once the shuttle program goes away and as painful as it's going to be for the men and women, not only in Florida that, that, that stack the shuttles for launch, but also... NASA workers throughout the entire system that provide support for the shuttle, it's only after that time, if the White House and the Congress decide to push ahead with the, the heavy lift launch rocket they want to build, which incidentally would be managed out of the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama, then you'd be able to leave Earth orbit for the first time since 1972. Now, the big deal with my first book, the premise of it was that Apollo worked because it was a mission that was looking for a spacecraft. And the shuttle didn't work because it was a spacecraft that was looking for a mission. So if we get the heavy lift launch rocket, then it's possible that if astronauts can leave Earth orbit and go somewhere to do something, then NASA will have that mission that they've lacked, frankly, since 1972. Will, will that, ha in your opinion, do you think that'll actually happen? Do you think we'll we'll actually get a new HLV heavy lift vehicle uh, and be able to go beyond low Earth orbit, either back to the moon, on to Mars, or beyond? 
Maybe. And I think that the the big deal is, and I'm kind of kind of waiting for this, because like everybody in Congress can drag their feet because there's no Russia for us to compete against directly, except you've got the Chinese that say they're going to go to the moon. Now, the, uh, the concern that's been raised to me by certain, I guess you call them lunar preservationists, is that international, sal- uh, international treaty states that no one country owns the moon. However, international salvage law is so murky that if somebody could physically get to the surface of the moon and go to any one of the, the Apollo landing sites, including Apollo 11, which is just a treasure trove of, of artifacts around the lunar landing legs that were left on the surface of the moon, they could conceivably, or at least the concern was presented to me, that they could take any of those artifacts from the surface of the moon put them in a museum, put them in a private collection, sell them on eBay, and the United States could grouse about it, but legally we may not have a leg to stand on. I'm kind of curious as to whether or not that kind of sparks a new competition as far as the space program is concerned. Otherwise, we'll be kind of like, you know, stuck with the people that gave us the U.S. Post Office, i.e. Uh, Congress and the White House, and who knows if we actually will achieve any of these goals. You know, Trebles asked earlier a pretty good question. Is uh, want, wants to know if you think that other countries like China will beat us to Mars because we know China has a lunar mission, right. uh, as does India, by the way. But what about Mars? You think China or India will beat us to Mars? They haven't stated, at least not that I've heard, that they actually have that goal. But then again, remember, I mean, like you know, when when President Kennedy challenged NASA to go to the moon, we had 15 minutes of, uh, of space experience, and we didn't even achieve orbit yet. I mean, our first astronaut, Alan Shepard despite the historic nature of his mission, was basically a glorified man shot out of a cannon. And yet the president came along and said, let's go to the moon. Right? Let's put up a space station, then let's go to the moon. And then after that, I mean, once they get used to that, I mean, who knows what their future goals might be. Interesting. What's your favorite part of space? Why do you do this? Um, actually, uh, well, I, was, I, was, I grew up in the 60s. Uh, my, my, my dad was in the Air Force, senior, senior NCO. And we were in Anchorage, Alaska, Elmendorf Air Force Base, when Apollo 11 landed. And then uh, after that, uh, my family was transferred down to Patrick Air Force Base, which is just south of the Kennedy Space Center on Florida's Atlantic coast. Mm-hmm. And there I was, like a 10-year-old kid, you know, walking out, as many 10-year-old kids did, to watch like Apollo 14 blast off, the Voyagers, the Vikings, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11. It was, a, it was a free light show, and you got to remember about that time Disney World that arrived in Florida, but you had to buy a ticket to go to Disney World. I mean, with NASA, you had this big old light show that you'd go out in your backyard and see for free. But it's funny, after Apollo, my most vivid memory as a, as a youngster of the Kennedy Space Center was the absolute death knell and malaise that occurred after the final Apollo mission. They took the Kennedy Space Center, and they had, like, it was, a, it was right around the time of the Bicentennial, 1976, and it was sort of a, a world's fair called Third Century America. And I'm kind of sitting there, you know, looking at, at these exhibits with the giant vehicle assembly building in the background, thinking to myself, something's missing here. I mean, it, 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 it shouldn't be like this. I mean, it, there, was, there was grandeur here. There was stuff going on. And now we've got these little, you know, cutesy exhibits. And NASA has its glory days been beyond it. And then... Like a lot of people, when the shuttle first flew in 81, I was in junior college at the time, and I can't even remember the first shuttle mission. I really, you know, it was not a big deal in the news. It was not a big deal in my consciousness. It wasn't until I had gone into uh, journalism and I was working on a completely different story on January 28th, 1986, Mm. when one of my coworkers went running past the production room where I was working. And nobody at my station runs that fast, so I stuck my head out and said, hey, what's going on? And they said, the shuttle just blew up. It, you know, challenged her with Krista McAuliffe on board. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I'm kind of like, yeah, sure, yeah, whatever, thing like that. I went back to what I was working on for about a tenth of a second. And then I realized, well, they're recording launch audio from the liftoff that just occurred in the next room. So I sort of, sort of you know, peeked around the corner to see what was going on. And it was just the most pasty face group of people that you'd ever seen in your life Mm -hmm. and it was at that point that i grabbed a set of news car keys a recorder and followed the mushroom cloud out to the kennedy space center and it was at that point that it was very apparent to me that this was a national story of national importance and it was going to be going on for a very long time and it was at that point that i decided to uh to really you know develop my 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 background covering space and that led to about 102 missions for for national public radio and kind of kept me busy a couple of books and uh kept me out of trouble basically now, you raise an interesting point, which was um, space didn't re-enter your consciousness until a giant disaster in space. And I think that happens to a lot of people, not just you. Um, 
is there a better, it seems kind of like a depressing way to get excited about space, and not to belittle the story, but I mean, is there a way that we can make this more interesting and awesome for people without having them want, because people like the big fire and the explosions, is there a way for us to make it awesome and exciting for people without the fire and explosion? Well, it's interesting, you bring, it's interesting you bring that up because uh, when, when President Obama put together the, uh, the Augustine Commission, one of the things they factored into what they were doing was PR, which kind of impressed the socks off me because that's something that NASA ordinarily, does, ordinarily doesn't do. And they said one of the reasons, getting back to that asteroid mission we were talking about, you can send people to an asteroid probably in 10 years, which means that you've actually got an end game there to show a disinterested public and a relatively fickle Congress in terms of what NASA is achieving. And then after that, the longer term goal of trying to send human beings to Mars, well, you've kind of gotten a little bit of interest from the asteroid mission, and then you build on that in terms of your public image. So it, the first time in a long time anybody's ever really looked in terms of what you know NASA's public image is like, and that's what the Augustine Commission did. So whether or not they decide to follow that, it's you know it's 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 up to the agency and it's up to the Congress. But at least the Augustine Commission laid it out. You've got to keep public interest. You've got to keep Congress engaged. Otherwise, there's just not going to be the interest or the money. And going to Mars is going to be enormously expensive. Awesome. Well, um, I did want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to keep you around for post show for a little bit. I do want to talk to you about what you think it's going to be like to live on Mars because living on Mars would be nothing like living on Earth. And uh, a lot of people liken it to the early settlers. But as you mentioned in your book, and I think this is a really good thing to mention, uh, it's a lot like that except that now you've got CNN covering it live, which yeah. you did not have before. So the dynamic is very, very different. So I'd like to talk to you about that uh, when we come back. Um, and I'd also like to talk to you about... Um, uh, you know, it's your next chapter, and I've, it, it, it's just one of those nights. Um, why, why we should go there at all? Uh, why even go to Mars? Who cares? Absolutely. Oh, and by the way, before we go to break here, just just a quick uh, note for your, uh, your your viewers here that uh, if you happen to be in the uh, the Marshall Space Flight area on uh, this coming Saturday, in fact, I'll be having a book signing at the uh, the Barnes and Noble at the Bridge Street Mall. That's this Saturday in Huntsville, Alabama. And if you happen to be in the nation's capital the last weekend before Thanksgiving. I'm going to have two signings at the uh, the National Air and Space Museum and the Smithsonian Zutvarhazy Center. So, nice. commercial uh, commercial over. Just wanted to let everybody know that Absolutely. was out there. Oh, well, it's not over yet. The book is Trailblazing Mars: NASA's Next Giant Leap. By the way, can you? Uh, you've got two books. Can you? Will you have both available for signing? Oh, sure. Okay. No yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, awesome. And where, uh, Pat? Where else can people find you online? Oh, uh, well, you can, um, uh, the, the book you can find, oh, you call your local book bookstore and, you know, throw the business their way. But uh, for some reason, if they're sold out, you can also go to uh, your local, uh, uh, like, Amazon.com and get a book that way. Or if you want to, you can go to the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center, because I was down there for a signing, and they had me uh, sign, like, an additional, gosh, uh, two or three cases of books. So they, they've got them there on their website. So uh, hopefully I didn't get a writer's cramp or nothing, so you can get one there if you like. Are you going to be down at STS-133? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately not. They've got me on a short leash up here. That's just before the Smithsonian signing, so uh, I'll be uh, watching it from afar. Awesome. All right. Uh, stay with us. We're going to join you in post-show. For those of you watching live, uh, we'll continue straight on. No need to do anything else. If you're watching on demand and you'd like to see the continued interview, sign up for Space Vidcast Epic, which you can find at spacevidcast.com slash epic. I do want to make a note, and we got to remind everyone way in advance, because otherwise you completely yell at us. Yes. Space Vidcast is based on Coordinated Universal Time every Friday at 2 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. The time of the show does not change. It is always 2 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time, and Coordinated Universal Time does not honor Daylight Savings Time. That means if you change your clock forward or backwards twice a year, the time for the show for you will change. So if you're currently Central Daylight Time, Mountain Daylight Time, Eastern Daylight Time, Pacific Daylight Time, so forth and so on, the show will be backwards one hour in about two weeks. I think November 7th is, is that the right so. date? Um, right, so we've got, uh, so there's this show, and then there's next week's show. Mm -hmm. After that, it'll change. It will change. So if you change your clocks, the time of the show will change. And the confusing part for a lot of people, especially in the U.S., is that not everyone changes their clocks. If you don't change your clock, if you don't honor daylight savings time, there is no change in the time show for you whatsoever. The show will remain exactly at the same time, which, by the way, once again, is 2 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us live. We're going to see you right here for the live coverage of STS-133 so in high definition, sponsored by Perforce Software. It's going to be awesome.
We'll see you next week. No, we'll see you for launch.